Hi, it's Itspo Storyteller and today we'll be covering the story of the most famous player from France. In only one year, Elias Satori, better known as Stefano, changed the way we perceive StarCraft II. He revolutionized the Zerg race and he was a living example of success even during the hardest meta and patches. Praised for his skills, Stefano was also criticized for his controversial behavior, from drinking too much alcohol to forfeiting official matches and not showing up at important games. So let's observe his career path together. I hope you'll enjoy this video and Stefano's example will encourage you to achieve your goals in your own lives. Stefano first entered the StarCraft Pro scene in early September 2010, joining an amateur team Toy Gaming. But this was not his first RTS experience. Long before playing StarCraft 2, Stefano showed interest in another Blizzard's game, Warcraft 3. When Stefano was only 10 years old, he bought the game and competed casually against the AI for two and a half years. He didn't have the access to the internet, but then he began to play against other players. His race choice was humans, and already in December 2008, Stefano defeated Wolf in the grand finals of the Pink Arena 12, winning his first offline tournament in the career. He then joined Millennium a week later and remained with the French team for some time prior to StarCraft's to release, achieving several top places in French flying events during that time. So he kinda came to StarCraft 2 with some esports experience, even though it later would be just insignificant to his future results. But the start was modest, Stefano chose Zerg as it was the most economy reliant race in StarCraft 2, and just as he was a Warcraft 3, Zerg players were using a lot of cheap units backed up by a robust economy. However, his start on the game didn't bring much success, Stefano participated in some local French tournaments, and in October he again joined the French team Millennium and started improving at a rapid speed. When I started, like gaming i didn't expect at all to be like bring to events paid and like feeded and uh, i get a hotel for free and stuff like that and they asked me to play for getting money so it's kind of strange but we're happy to be in this situation i must say yeah his first premier tournament was home story cup and unfortunately the only videos we have are of very low quality but stefano still impressed the viewers by beating huck White Ra and Jinro. Even though he didn't place in top 3 and his run ended in the lower bracket, that was still a great first result. Just a week after his Home Story Cups run, he won the French Master Series finals in 2011, establishing himself as the best player from France. His initial success started to pile up, and already in mid-2011 Stefano was recognized as one of the most promising non-Korean players. His next stop was in Finland, Asus Rock Summer, and the group stage was relatively easy. He faced Bix and Satini, quite good but not really Stefano's level players. The only threat was from Bratok, a veteran of the Russian esports scene who first made a name for himself back in StarCraft Brood War. The series were very quick as both players supposedly didn't want to show their build orders to the public. It was obvious that both Stefano and Bratak would advance, so they played a lot of gimmicks and funny builds like Ghost Rush and the Proxy Hatchery. Overall, the series were really fun to watch. The real reason why they played so much weird stuff was because they both really wanted to avoid sending the playoffs bracket and get an easier opponent thanks to the seeding. In the playoffs, Stefano, thanks to Bretox's trap, faced the best Taiwanese player, Sen. It was a ZVZ matchup, historically the worst one for the French player. And despite that later Stefano would become famous for his macro-oriented playstyle, in the early days he was a cheesy player. However, it was a normal thing in Wings of Liberty, where most matches were quick and often ended before any player could take the third base. In ZVZ against Sand, Stefano demonstrated great bane and link control and became victorious with a 2-1 score. The next opponent was Cyplo, who lost to Stefano in a tough best of three series. Now it was the time for the semi-finals, where the French player met Dimaga. Stefano tried different build orders, improvising with links and faster attacks, but it seemed like he couldn't take a straight-up macro duel with Ukraine's best player. It was also a special key match, because Stefano admitted that he took after Dimaga when he first started playing StarCraft 2, so it was like the teacher versus pupil kind of duel. Basically, all the links from Stefano were trapped away from the bailings, and another queen goes down. Oh, that's not pleasant at all. And now Damaga going for it right here. Will this be enough to finish off Stefano? Will it be enough to put Damaga into the finals? It's looking really likely right now as Damaga absolutely decimates this drone line. And there's really not a lot coming out for Stefano, honestly. Bumping out 12 Zerglings, it's not going to be enough. There's just no way that's going to happen. And even I don't think the might of Stefano is going to hold up against this. GG, ladies and gentlemen. Demaga is in the finals 
After one of the best DBZ I think anyone's ever had the pleasure to win. But in the end, Stefano lost with a 3-2 score, dropping to play with Bratok once again for the third place. And this time, he won three victories in a row, showing just great micro skills. This was already the biggest result for Stefano, but it was only the very beginning. He then traveled to IM Cologne, where he couldn't advance out of the group. It was a tough one with Puma and Mana, so no real pressure on him. Stefano was a strong contender, but he hasn't proved to be anywhere close to being the best foreigner. Yet. I mean, I remember this quote of you saying that you think ZVP is actually imbalanced in favor of Zerg. It is, yeah. It is. So, but, you know, like most pros, they don't say that because they're afraid Blizzard's going to balance it. <coughs> the matchup is imbalanced. They should fix it because most of the people, uh, Protoss, are losing stupidly. The Zerg is way ahead and I feel sorry for them. <laughs> All right. Um, the next major stop for our Zerg player was the IPL Season 3, a Premier American League which brought many players all around the globe to compete for a large prize pool. It was one of his hardest challenges because there were plenty of current competitors with GSL records. Stefano still made it through the qualifiers to secure a paid trip, beating many talented players including MMA, Revival, Zoke and Kivikaki. Speaking about Kivikaki, he was the exact opponent Stefano faced in the playoffs. If this name doesn't ring a bell, he was the best Canadian player shortly before Huck came to the scene with his top 3 control. And now let's see how the match went on. But what is more interesting, Kivikaki was among Protoss pioneers who liked to use a lot of Sky units. His trademark build order included a lot of extra void rays to stop roaches early on. However, the Canadian player needed to have a very precise and perfectly executed sentry micro to stop Stefano from swarming his positions. At third base, we'll have to see if he has the DPS to do the damage. How are Kiwikaki's force fields going to be? Pretty good, but those Hydras do have the range they need as well, so the Hydras can get away in time. Look at how fast those sentries die to the Hydralisks. That yeah, really is scary. Man. There are so many units being added to the mix as well. 11 yeah. Hydras, multiple roaches, six actually at once, and a ton of links coming up, so Stefano just wants to flood his opponent. Yeah, Kiwi Kaki not out of this quite yet, though. He's doing a good job of keeping those Void Rays alive for the most part, doing a great job with Certainly. the Force Fields, just Certainly. zoning out the Hydras and looking at oh. Stefano, he's going to make his way around the right-hand side. More good Force Fields going oh. Oh, down. Some of those Hydras are able to attack, but none of the Roaches are. Yeah, some of the Hydras oh, coming in from the side wow. as well. But there's so many units here for Stefano. He's starting to drive away that Void Ray wall. There's only a few yep. Stalkers left, and it looks like Stefano may be able to overrun his opponent. Yeah, just getting that overwhelming unit advantage. The second map would become one of the best StarCraft 2 matches in history. Shatra Temple is quite a big and open map, fitting Stefano's playstyle best. Kivikaki on the other hand would have a lot of trouble since it's too difficult to engage with sentries, and the only hope for him was to get to the late game stage and try to survive until the moment he gets the ultimate Protoss composition. And he succeeded. Stefano also chose not to be extra aggressive and was happily doing his micro stuff at home, and soon there would be a blood buff. We may but be doing a mass recall here. He's just going to try and engage as many units as he can. I think he might. Not enough corruptors really make the Colossi worry too much. Blinking ahead to take out the Broodlords. But you know what? The Archons are going to be have to be the ones to take out the Broodlings this time. Oh, there's a recall. He doesn't get quite everything and he's going to lose some Archons. After so many back and forth intense fights, Kivikaki was feeling unsafe about direct engagements. He realized it's too risky to try to poke the Zerg player at the front. So he came up with a brilliant idea followed by the final battle. Drawing the army for Stefano all the way. Oh, There's the recall. the recall into the main. Oh, and Stefano losing quite a bit. The high tech is just about to go down. He has to pull all of his units across. More void rays are being added to the mix. There goes Hive. There goes technology. Oh, Greater so Spire going to fall as well. Greater Spire going down. Infestation pit going down. You know what? He has got enough energy on that mothership for another recall. Oh, he really does. So he's going to be able to pull them back in just a second as soon as yep. the Brewlords get in position. So uh, as long as more neural pair Parasites don't go on. A lot of damage going to be done. Those corruptors oh. are moving back. And oh, it looks like boy. some of the overseers taken out. Kiwikaki pulling back, making sure that he doesn't get neural parasite. Just like you said, getting everything into a nice big ball. And there they go. There's the recall. Man. Wow. Kiwikaki. This guy is on fire. Holy Doa, cow. What? I think this may be the best game I've ever casted. This could be one of the best, easily one of the best ZVPs <laughs> I have ever seen in my life. This is amazing. You guys are lucky to be here and see this. This is awesome. got a stupid grin on my face the entire yeah. time. Yeah. You guys on the stream, two at home. This is historic. And oh, both players being just so careful, afraid to commit here just because 
it is scary to take that step, you know? Oh my god. All right. So, uh, man, you know what? Kibikaki wanted a rematch, and he certainly made the most of it I because this game has been so. incredible. Wow. See what All happens right. when he doesn't forget Warp Gate Research. <laughs> <laughs> so now he's going to make his way over to the right. Um, yep. Just waiting for that big push for one of these players to commit. Kibikaki's yeah. been oh, looking at all sides. Go. Here it goes. Oh, here we don't oh. go. Here we go now for sure. There's oh, the fungal. fungal. All the on units everything. are revealed. Oh. oh, is he going to jump in there, though? No, the Archon's not jumping in. The Mothership just getting a little bit aggressive. Oh, he's oh, got a second he one. He got a second one. The Archons are not jumping in. Oh, there, there goes one. They are. And one and a half another. seconds, and then the Archons will come back. Stefano trying to get away by the Colossi. The army. are doing so much damage. Oh, man, everything bunched up right there, and I think... Kiwikaki, is he going to have enough? Is he going to take out the Broodlords? There are so few Broodlords left. Just a couple left remaining on the field. Oh, and then it's man. all ground forces. Kiwikaki's got, 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 got it. He's got it. He's got it. He's got it. Kiwikaki takes this. out the last Broodlord. Oh, oh my, God. my God. 27 supply right now for Stefano. Stefano trying to make some units, but it is over, guys. Kiwikaki is winning. Wow. Rats. Oh, I can't believe oh that. Oh, my God. Wow. This was truly an incredible comeback, but Stefano quickly dispatched the Protoss force in the third game and advanced to the next round. It was really tough, perhaps the French player realized it's not gonna be an easy walk for him, as even the first round at IPL proved to be a real challenge, but after that victory, Stefano was just unstoppable. Stefano is about to roll to a quick 2-0 against a former Codes Zerg. Here we go! The wings go in! The wretches come up from the back! The foreign hope could possibly keep it alive here versus Anori. As we see his units begin to fall, Blink is not yet done. There's nowhere for these stalkers to go. The probes are gonna come out! And Apollo, I think Stefano has done it! CC is in a lot of trouble, ladies and gentlemen. Here <laughs> are the Banelings. And now is when the STC face palms. Give it up for Stefano! Finally, he got to the last round to play against Lucky, which was also a funny turn of events because Lucky was pretty much an underdog just like Stefano. He never had any great results and couldn't even get into the cold ass, but he managed to beat a lot of skillful guys and especially make a big upset defeating Boxer in the first round. And sadly, we didn't see the Brood War Legend further in the tournament. But Lucky was really unlucky in the series and it was probably the easiest 4-0 for Stefano in this tournament. Ladies and gentlemen, he is poised to take this game. I think he is as well. Reinforcements streaming in across the map. And I think we're gonna have our IPL Season 3 champion. Stefano takes the game. Bring the house down, that was awesome. So is this the result of serious hard work? Do you feel like, like everything you've done has paid off? How Talk to me, talk to me, please. No, <laughs> I, I don't think I, I deserve it more than he does, because I didn't play enough to get the, this win, I think. But I, I have the skill, I guess. <laughs> that, that is awfully humble of you, sir. We cannot deny that you do have the skill. Where are you going to take this skill now? To the bank. To the bank! <laughs> <laughs> How did Stefano break to the top level so quickly? From being a relatively unknown French player to becoming the best known Korean talent, this was a big leap for him. Thus, in only one year, Stefano achieved as many results as many players would achieve throughout their whole careers. In September, just one month prior to the IPL, Stefano also announced that he would extend his pro gaming career for one more year and he kept on training full time instead of going to a university. But according to Stefano, he wasn't really a hard-working player like many others who would grind on ladder for 12 hours per day. But Stefano was a clever and talented guy and could get away with less games. It was possible due to his in-game flexibility. Stefano was able to play any strategy from doing cheeky Olins to executing rock-solid standard things all Zergs in the world did. What's a normal schedule like for you? <coughs> I don't really have a schedule. I play what I want, but usually it's at least three hours a day and goes up to five but i really can't play more uh, well i do play more only when i stream and i see i have lots of viewers so i don't want to drop them what's uh so what's your secret my secret yeah to being good and practicing so little uh, i guess i'm always in a good mood when i play i don't have 
like feelings and think about imbalance and stuff. So I don't go as a loser in any game. So you don't rage? Never. Apart from strategy picks, Stefano was also great at multitasking and his APM was one of the highest in the pro scene. The map is covered in creep, overlords are positioned where needed and this is how most Stefano's games would look. It was like a sly spider weaving webs to catch the annoying turn on Protoss flies. Stefano was also among the very first Zerg players to popularize greedy economy playstyle. Although he was already great at basic build orders, he was also doing a lot of experiments with other playstyles, the most notable Lynx and Infestors, a combo that allowed Stefano extend his reach over the map. Thanks to the speedy Lynx and creep coverage, Stefano could traverse the map with a flash speed and also do many counter-attacks. His trademark for ZVP was a 200 limit timing with Roach and Lynx, aimed to punish Protoss third expansion. And Stefano just building roaches, roaches and more roaches going for the infestation pit and Hero is on the ropes. Just two weeks after the IPL, Stefano traveled to Electronic Sports World Cup 2011. Uh, this was another stunning performance. There were only a few Korean players, Stefano still showed some of his best games and swept the whole tournament easily. He only dropped three maps for the whole thing, having a 19-3 record and claiming the first place. Now nobody had any doubts that Stefano has finally become the king of the non-Korean scene. But despite this, Stefano showed some inconsistent results later this year. During the battle in Berlin, he was defeated by Goody, a German player who was famous for his mech playstyle. And the same curse happened shortly after Dreamhack Winter, where Stefano demonstrated a complete lackluster performance, losing to seemingly worse players Shad and Cloud during the second group stage. What was the reason? Despite being highly praised for his in-game skills, Stefano was sometimes criticized for his personal behavior. We'll talk about that later in this video, but it's important to mention that he was really fond of partying. That was a craving desire for him. Guys, late in his career he was sponsored by a literal StarCraft bar. And once he even got arrested for drinking too much in public after Dreamhack, making it the first esports mug shot. Even here Stefano was setting records. Perhaps Stefano didn't have great discipline and had some bad habits, but he was still a prodigy who soon traveled to the birthplace of esports, South Korea. Thanks to his IPL victory, he was invited to participate in 2011 GSL Blizzard Cup. Placed in a group with Don Raegu, MVP, MC and Hero, Stefano found himself at the most challenging tournament he ever played in his life. Was the French player good enough to beat the Korean champions? That's what we're about to see. The format was a group stage with best of one, so each map was incredibly important for all players. The first opponent is Hero. Do not be mistaken with Hero, the latest GSL winner. Stefano tries to execute his signature mass roach link attack, and it does surprise the Korean player. Roaches, roaches, and more roaches going for the infestation pit, and Hero is on the ropes. Yeah, man, his forces have been surrounded here slightly, and he's got to actually retreat back to his natural. But meanwhile, roaches are just killing all of his probes at the third base, and I can't see Hero coming back from this. The next competitor is Don Raigu, one of the strongest Zerg players in Korea, also a matchup where Stefano had some issues before. Even up to this day, many Korean players prefer to be very aggressive and cheesy, even if they outclass their opponent in a micro game, and Don Raigu goes for a big Zerg bailing attack from one base, trying to punish Stefano for his early second base. And after 10 minutes of intense link bane micro, one of them emerges victorious. Not to mention all the damage it's been able to do. No Stefano pulling just a few Zerlings to try to target down those Banelings. And Stefano is now getting more and more workers. He's already ahead 22 to 13 workers. And those Zerlings might be the last final attack of PRG. G -G. The GG! This is an amazing start for our French hero. He already took down two strongest opponents of this tournament and he needs only one more victory to make it out of the group. Now it was the time to defeat Bostos and MC, the greatest Protoss player of those times. And the match happened on dual sides, a map where you have a lot of difficulties as a Protoss player when you need to wall off your expansion. So Stefano made the right decision to attack, but MC's defense was just impeccable. This army, and MC is not done yet. Kaldor continuing to poke here. Nice micro, the Roach is trying to target down the Colossi. I feel like he may be targeting too much though, because the Stalker is doing a ton of damage as well as that Immortal. And don't forget that MC is about to be mined out in his base. He's still on two bases. He needs to win this fight, but it's looking quite well for him right now. The Protoss player with 120 supply against Stefano, 77. Stefano losing unit after unit. The third base under fire is dying. 
and there is the well played. This time Stefano's signature Mass Roach playstyle didn't work, and now he had to play the last match against MVP, the King of Terrans. Now, this was probably the hardest opponent in this group, and he prepared something special for Stefano. It was a Blue Flame Helens and Marines push that proved deadly to the French player. And the Greens are trying to block, the Zerglings come in as well, MVP is going for the attack and here come all the Zerglings being toasted by all those Blue Flame Hellions. Stefano already started to transfuse his spine crawlers. two in the back, won't do him any good at all, he's waiting for the Infestors, no pet dodge plans, adding the plus two plus two attack upgrades, but will it be enough, we have 95 supply for MVP, Stefano down to 70, Zerglings won't be enough to deal with the Blue Flame Hellions. This won't cut it, that won't cut it at all, the Queens are about to die, Stefano about to lose his economy. With 2-2 two -two -two scores, Stefano still had a chance to advance to the main bracket, but there were only two players with this result, he and MC, who also won only two matches, and since their personal encounter ended in MC's favor, he was to advance, while Stefano was eliminated from the tournament. Sadly for him, but... Ilya Satori chose to stay in Korea for a month to practice in OCG Team House and approve his results, with no other tournament participations. He, anyway, quickly got to the top 10 ladder on the local server. The year 2012 started with some prominent online tournaments, and in short it was a great time for Stefano, who claimed mostly first places. Very soon he took part in Asus Rock, and this was the exact tournament series where Ilya Satori demonstrated his great skills for the first time, and once again, Stefano quickly dispatched all the opponents up to the final challenger. It was the exact time when the competition was getting a lot more severe for most European and American players. The South Korean players had a better infrastructure with teams, team houses and overall sponsorships in esports, and soon they started traveling around the world more often. And those players were outclassing most of the other competitors thanks to this training background, and soon only a few foreigners could really perform well against GSL participants. But even for Stefano, who was the best at those times, it was close to being impossible. Stefano only has three infestors and ultralisk left. He is looking to go out of this game. He needs to start mining immediately. Oh my god, I can't believe Port held that position again and he was in position. The stress word there for every single game. He's chasing down the infestors. They are That's running. That's it. GG, ladies and gentlemen. TSL Port is your assembly winter champion. And there's no doubt about it, Total Biscuit. Paul was the best player here, even qualifying second, and Blink's gonna be... Soon Stefano announced his American tour. Some really important events were scheduled at spring and summer, and the first one would be Lone Star Clash, where Stefano met little resistance up until the moment he faced Paul. And this time, however, his nemesis wasn't as strong as Asus Rock a couple of weeks prior to that encounter. Despite him being the absolute strongest player outside of Korea, Stefano sometimes had upsets during important tournaments. Just after Lone Star Clash, he participated in MLG Winter, dropped to the lower bracket very early after a defeat by his nemesis Pult, and there were no scary players for him, except for Idra, who was awaiting him in the next round. But all of a sudden Stefano lost to Korean Protoss Inari, who was way worse than Stefano. But nevertheless, except for that one blunder, Stefano was doing really great, placing high in most tournaments he took part in. For example, his Red Bull run was really impressive, taking down a lot of Korean legends. Party's gonna have to have extremely fast reflexes to deal with all these simultaneous pushes. Now, Party down here is gonna be forced to use at least a few force fields down there, but really, this just is going to leave his third base almost completely uh -oh. exposed. Stefano can absolutely just brute force right through this as his assault continues. And it looks like Stefano hitting in both places at once, continuing to add on roaches, but if these gateways get up and there's just even a little bit of time spent. Oh no, it looks like Stefano took advantage of Parting's distraction and is just flooding in the front with ease. Daybreak, known for that Zerg long-term aggression, but man, is Parting just having trouble with this early mid-game spot and there goes the main base in a ton of trouble. And now Stefano pretty much has a free reign over Parting's base as he just continues to mill oh, through the all of those. Oh, man, no, no more stalkers. stalkers.
Overall, this period was the most successful in Stefano's career. It was also the time when he brought a lot of controversial behavior to the table. Actually, the first controversial event happened already in 2011. He signed a contract with the American team Complexity Gaming, only to turn down this legal document a few hours later in order to remain on the French team Millennium. This was already after all the announcements had gone public. Now, this mutual misunderstanding between the two teams led to a series of contradictory statements, which resulted on a notable heated discussion about the professionalism of the free parties, as well as questions about the reliability of contracts in esports. And Stefano eventually had to pay a huge fine to compensate for all the troubles he created. Another issue was with cancelled matches. Stefano wouldn't turn up for some events or scheduled matches with no excuses or information provided. And this happened several times and he was heavily criticized by the community and manager for such a, quote, arrogant behavior. Anyway, the foreign hope carried on and it was the time to play the most prestigious American event, the North American Star League. And oh my, Stefano was completely unstoppable at this event. What's he gonna defend with? He's just got a handful of units behind the wall. Uh, and uh, those depots fall. The next depots are going to fall. That's supply blocks, BC and Stefano. 130 supply taking out more depots. BC completely incapable of producing units. And that is going to be curtains. Around that time, Stefano was also invited to participate in GSL Codes, and everybody was thrilled to see him compete on the Korean soil, but it never happened, at least in 2012. Stefano just turned down the invitation to focus on European and American tournaments, as GSL could take too much time for him. So let's get back to our tournament. In the semi-finals, he met MC once again, the guy who would often be too much for Stefano, and indeed MC was the favorite to win the tournament, and the series got really hot for both of them. Party. Oh, picks up the Immortals, in fact, and uh, oh, oh, nice, nice forest, forest fields. fields. Chopping off the lings, a couple more escape. Great control by Stefano. Oh, yeah, the Immortals actually being dropped on top of the Infestors. Oh, nice play. Can't micro win your fungal. One Immortal dies immediately. Good force fields from MC, oh, but there's the just prism. so much. Zerg, the War Prism will fall. Stefano says, force field all you want. I'm just going to go around. Roaches and Ling's gonna try to catch the tail end of this army, and as those force fields expire, we're gonna see a big Zerg sandwich with MC in the middle. The sentries fall, the zealots fall, and GG is called. Stefano wins 4 2 against MC and will advance to the North American Star League Season 3 Grand Finals. And as for the finals, it was just easy. After the victory over MC, there was no match for Stefano. Despite just recently dominating this tournament, Stefano didn't then bring up a solid performance in the upcoming MLGs, losing to different Koreans and especially getting beaten by Sasa, a Swedish Protoss player. However, around the same time, Stefano cemented himself as the best French player, as if it wasn't already obvious, by winning WCS 2012 French qualifiers. WCS European Finals 2012 was the most important event for many players. Unlike modern WCS events, this one was using a national system. Each country had its own or merged with others qualification matches to determine the best players. And Stefano was among three representatives from France, and he needed to bring victory home at all costs. Let's discuss the state of the game for a second. In 2012, Zerg was the Imbo race due to many reasons, mainly because of Infestor Broodlord's composition. It did contribute to Stefano's results, but of course it wasn't the cause, as most of his games were won by his trademark strategies with Roche Links and many other creative pushes. But it's crucial to know that most games now were either mid-game pushes or long late game macros, where Zerg race was the favorite. And this was one of the reasons why WCS Europe was in fasted with Zerg players, so Stefano had to deal with his worst matchup once again. However, it all started with ZVP, his favorite matchup. Hesu Ops, hailing from Germany, was the first player to stand against Stefano, but it wasn't a serious threat for the French genius. Neither were Deishi or Lovely, they were just outclassed by Stefano, and it seemed like a very easy tournament up until the encounter with Lucifron. 
In 2012, there were a few players who were considered really strong in the European scene, and those were Grubby, Naniwa, Happy, Nurture, Mana, but all of them were quickly overshadowed by two aspiring talents, Lucifron and Vortex. These were Spanish brothers who posed the most danger for Stefano. However, Stefano still managed to become the first place finisher, establishing himself as the best European player. And then we have the Evil Genius's Curse. Now, this was a community meme that was connected with the team's results. Each player who got into EG was once a very promising competitor with either a rising career or already great results. After some time in the team, such player would fall lower, lower and lower in the results, failing to win even against much worse competitors. This happened to Idra and Hawk. Both of them had most of their career achievements prior to getting transferred to Evil Geniuses. And so did happen with Stefano. The curse was too strong. But the curse has to wait. The French player is still rocking and winning left and right. Another great result for Stefano was winning Lone Star Clash 2, where he met in the finals with Bombar. It was an amazing result, but still, there was something more meaningful and important for all players around the world the WCS Global Finals. However, shortly before WCS Global Finals, Stefano had to miss some tournament activity due to his behavior, and this time it was a more serious scandal. During Blink's stream, that is an English Protoss player, Stefano was seen chatting with him about having molested an underage girl. Even though it was just a silly joke, as Stefano later elaborated, EG reacted severely and suspended Stefano for such comments from all the tournaments for a month. Stefano apologized on Twitter later that day, saying it was just a private joke, nothing serious. But some fans didn't feel his apology was satisfactory, and they began to email Evil Genius' sponsors about his actions, including Intel, Monster Energy and Steel Series. Following this, Stefano tweeted that it was people's stupidity that caused him to regret going professional with StarCraft, and that in turn caused him to play poorly. However, he then apologized once again for his words and also paid a big fine for such a behavior. But let's get back to our grand tournament. Unfortunately for Stefano, he got into the only group of death that was in this tournament. Not only did he have a brilliant Protoss player hero, he also had to play his worst ZVZ matchup against Idra and Roro, both really great Zerg players. The first match was against the Korean Protoss. Unlike Parsing, Hero wasn't doing as many Olens and Cheeses and could play a decent macro game. Sometimes he would mix it up with unique build orders that involved Sky Protoss, so it wasn't a problem for Stefano, the first game goes just as planned. But already the second game was one of the most intense for Stefano in this tournament. It seems like he's got a good macro setup for his ultimate Broodlord and Fester army, but Hero was fighting to death and didn't want to surrender no matter how hard Stefano was trying to outplay him. Really, High Temple are not that good versus anything that you see on the field right now. Yes, he can storm the Broodlords, yes, he can storm the Infestors, but they're just gonna keep on coming, and the Infestors can easily dodge that, because the Broodlords will, uh, why do I keep calling them Broodlords? I don't know, it just cracks me up. The uh, Broodlords can just, you know, absorb a lot of the damage and focus down those High Temple before they're in, in position, and honestly, I think Hero just frustrated with uh, with that counterattack. That was really the main deciding factor in this game, and Stefano's like, you know what, I'll take it. If you Gonna, gonna donate that many, uh, that many, that many workers to me. Then go, go right ahead. This was a perfect start for our French player, and lucky for him, his next opponent wasn't a Korean Zerg Roro. He actually had to face Idra for the first time in his career. By the way, both of them never met each other or any other tournaments up to this date, and this encounter was highly anticipated by all viewers. But it should be easy for Stefano. For the last year, even though he had some hardships with the Zerg vs Zerg matchup, he was constantly beating top tier players such as Violet or Symbol, and Idra, on the other hand, was on decline and didn't really perform well throughout the whole year. By the way, if you want to hear more about the American player, you can check out my two videos about him. The first map is Antigua Shipyard, a macro-oriented one-meter room for passive defensive playstyle. Idra was well known exactly for his preference to play passive, greedy games, so Stefano only needed to outperform his American opponent in the late stage with his impeccable multitasking and map control. But somehow the match proves to be a lot harder that... Uh, it should have been for the French competitor. Both players were trading blows and it was uncertain who would emerge victorious. 
that Idra has got those additional two mining bases. But here we go, we've got a great attack angle for Idra right now. And I think this could be it, guys. You can see Stefano's supply absolutely plummeting. Idra knew he had the better attack angle. And there is a well played, well played. Idra was able to keep an income advantage for the whole game, so the best foreigner couldn't catch up with him. And eventually, there is the second map, Daybreak. The game once again came down to Roshan Festa trades, and Stefano didn't have a second chance to make any mistakes. A good fungal growth goes down over there for Stefano, capturing a lot of units, preventing them from engaging. But well, Infested Terrans getting lobbed forward by Idra, they're going to soak up some fire, do some good damage as well. And Stefano, he's waiting for those roaches to come out. He is so desperate for those reinforcements. He's got units coming in from the side, which of course will tell his attack angle, will help him deal with the more sizable force. But Idra, he is just powering forward as best he can. And, well, it looks like most of Stefano's units are getting taken out here incredibly quickly. Meanwhile, behind this, Stefano is not taking any more bases, whereas Idra is taking his fifth base. Stefano loses his fourth, and we're now in a situation very, very similar to that of Game 1, where, of course, Idra is very, very comfortable in his income, very, very comfortable in his bases. He's up at 71 workers to the 64 of Stefano, and, well, you can see here Idra just powering forward, and there is the... And suddenly, Idra advances from the first place out of the group, while Stefano has to play a decider match next. It was a huge upset and once again Stefano had to face Hero in a ZVP matchup. Both now were aware of each other's playstyle and once again it all comes down just to execution, multitasking and a cold mind to outplay your opponent. The Stalkers now pushing out the natural. Stefano's only on two base right now, so even if he cleans this up, it is not going to be enough. The plus three attack showing you how effective plus three attack can really be. Now having to evacuate the natural, and Stefano is currently down to one base. That is a lot of drones here, though. They are put on hold position, it does look like. And that's going to try to buy some time on these zealots. You can see it's actually being quite effective at cleaning out these zealots. So using the Zerg version of the force field, but unfortunately, I don't think it's going to be enough here. Stefano, while he did clean out the Zealots, still has a lot of work to do. If he wants to take this out, 87 supply to 159. And you can see Hero now up to four bases versus the one base Zerg. Yes, there are Broodlords ready to go, but uh, it looks like Hero doesn't even care. He knows he's so far ahead that every Broodlord he takes out is almost invaluable. Even though he lost all his Stalkers in that engagement, he already knows that he's got the money, he's got the power, and he's got the production to be able to seal this game while Stefano is stuck on just one base. But you can see how powerful Broodlords actually are able to hold that off almost by themselves. And Stefano, even though he was victorious in that last battle, you can just see Eunice lost right there. There's the well played. So this way, Stefano was eliminated during the group stage. It was a heartbreaking moment for the whole European community as he was the strongest, the best foreigner who could possibly claim the trophy. It was not destined to happen this time, but neither Stefano nor fans knew that this was the peak of his career. From now on, the EG curse held a tight grip over Stefano, and his results would only worsen month after month. What was the true cause of it is uncertain, and I hope I would be able to ask Stefano for an interview one day. However, 100% it wasn't a lack of passion, and Stefano didn't retire on peak of his career, but the end of 2012 wasn't marked by any achievements. Stefano didn't get any top 3 and was often defeated by less skillful players. But anyways, his plans were even more ambitious for 2013. Stefano accepts GOM TV's invitation and goes to South Korea. There he would participate in GSL, the most difficult, prestigious tournament that has ever been in StarCraft 2. This happened because Paul Forfighter his spot to move to the United States, and so the spot was awarded to the French player. And once again, Stefano got really unlucky in the seedings. He got into the group with Don Regu and Innovation, both amazingly strong competitors. On Whirlwind, at first glance, the French player seemed to be playing much better than his Korean opponent. Innovation was expanding at a very slow pace and he basically let Stefano amass a 85 drones economy, allowing the foreign hop to transition into the late game easily. It seemed like from now on Stefano should have a good lead, but Innovation showed the best Korean multitask. He was dropping left and right, making Stefano's economy bleed while also constantly distracting the attention at the main front. And thus, our French hero dropped to the elimination match to play against Hack, whom he defeated with a 2-0 score quite easily. He then again had to face innovation, and soon Stefano felt the main difficulty in GSL. Unlike most European or American tournaments, GSL was famous for its strategy and build order preparations. Players knew their opponents weeks ahead and always tried to do something unique and unexpected based on the enemy's playstyle. This is what happened in the next best of three. Even though Stefano was rock solid in mid game and late game, innovation did some cheeky build orders 
players that caught the French player by surprise. Now, he's got to start the links, he starts 22. He may even need to pull up into his main and try to, to sacrifice his natural and pull back and get the investors out. He needs the investors. He, he can't even afford passes as an investor now. He doesn't have enough resources. He comes through here. There are so many Marauders he can't quite connect with his Baileys. There are enough links here to maybe break through. It's close, but it looks like Innovation has too much. 61 to 21 RB Spy, the failing Ness goes down. Zafato came close, but it looks like Innovation is just too much for him here. He's got way too many Marauders. He can't make the investors. He's trying to sneak Baileys around to catch reinforcements. The supply looks close. But that doesn't really tell the tale here. There are SCVs in the main base for some reason. These units are low on hit points. He needs good bailing hits, but look at the split from Innovation. He's got us around. That's it. The infestation pit will go down, and so will the history of Stefano in his first Codest match. The mule goes down. The lair will follow. Congratulations. Good luck. GG Innovation. Stefano was later eliminated from GSL and Code A, being defeated by Protoss player Flying. It was a really upsetting moment for him and the fans, since it seemed like Stefano was actually no worse than the Korean competitors. Luckily, it wasn't the only Korean tournament Stefano took part in. Soon he would participate in the Pro League, the most prestigious team league in the world. Stefano was a part of Evil Genius's liquid roster, including players from all over the world. The funny thing is that Ilya Satori once again didn't escape the drama. In the first match against Hero, Stefano typed GLHF in the chat, as it was just the custom for foreigners. However, this was against Caspar's rules, and the players may only use the chat to request a pause or type out with GG when accepting defeat. And many players have been disqualified due to this, and the list is actually ridiculously long. Just look at those low breakers. But Stefano was presumably unaware of this, and when the referee requested for a pause shortly afterwards, Hero responded to Stefano with GL. And Stefano was not disqualified for the offense, and many fans suggested that it was due to the fact that Hero actually responded to his words. Afterwards, the game went on as usual, with Stefano showing some really sick games throughout the three rounds he took part in. He played in total 11 games in this tournament, having a 5 to 6 score, but Evil Genius and Liquid still finished in the last place, being the worst roster in the league. In 2013, Stefano was unsure where to play. The region lock was introduced at that time, and each player had to choose only one region to play in the next season, and Stefano was divided between Europe and Korea. Even though he actually qualified for Code S, he turned it down and chose to return back to his home country and participate in the first season of WCS Europe. It was also the time for the new expansion, How to the Swarm. Having returned to Europe, Stefano took part in two important tournaments, I am Katowice and Dreamhack Stockholm. His results were quite mediocre, dropping out early in both competitions. And despite earning a lot of experience in South Korea, Stefano wasn't able to apply it immediately. Already in May, he had his first matches in WCS Europe Season 1, where he suddenly had difficulties with Baby Knight, losing his series to the Danish Protoss. However, except for this one upset, Stefano easily defeated all other opponents including Dimaga, Torzin and Grubby. In playoffs, he was once again matched against Baby Knight, and this time Stefano showed the brilliance of his new ZVP. These useless cannons here. Yeah, and this is really, really Whoa. hurting him. I don't think he can really make this actually happen. He's gonna go for it anyway. These fungals are gonna shut down so much of Baby Knight right now. This is really his last ditch effort. If this doesn't kill off Stefano, nothing else will. The Zealots get taken out by Locust Storms, and there you go. GG. Stefano takes the victory 3 to 0. Well, let's talk about the game a bit. As it happened with a lot of players, the legends and most accomplished players of Wings of Liberty often had trouble adapting to the new realm of Heart of the Swarm, and the new expansion changed all three matchups, basically reinventing most of the strategies that existed in the previous edition. And this could have contributed to Stefano's hardships in the beginning. As for ZVP matchups especially, most their players were now forced to play a rather campy playstyle of using Swarm hosts. Then Stefano seemed anyway to adapt quite fast to most changes. Already in semi-finals, Stefano faced 4GG, a skillful Terran player. However, he was not a match for Stefanov, who dominated him in the mid and late game. Their series also had a nice moment with Widow Mines that were just introduced into the game. Next fight, Widow Mines and Marines, 3-3 three, three Marines. The Banelings, the Banelings, the Banelings. Oh, they're gonna the Mutalist oh! Oh! oh my god! Fireworks! Everything gets obliterated! The Widow Mines oh! and Banelings not working out too well for him now! 
The same great performance should have happened against MVP. Stefano was doing really well on Belcher West stage, but MVP showed his amazing ability to adapt and diversify his playstyle on the fly. Each map was a completely new strategy that left Stefano puzzled. Army supply 46 for Stefano, 114 wow. for MVP. It's slowly but surely now going in the favor here. Of Stefano. Uh, Congratulations, yeah, he knows. Well go. done, MVP picks up the victory. Four to one, Kolaris. MVP retains his spot as one of the strongest players in the entirety of StarCraft. Heart of the Swarm transitioning on World Championship Series European Champion. And then the EG curse kicked in. Since this second place on WCS Europe, Stefano has never reached finals ever again. Why did it happen and how the best player of 2012 suddenly became just an average or at least good Zerg player in 2013? Apart from playing a new expansion, there was another explanation that makes a lot of sense. In May, during the group stage battles in WCS Europe, Stefano announced his plans to retire in August the same year. Even though it could have been shocking for some fans, Stefano himself said already in 2011 that he planned to earn as much money as he could from StarCraft 2 to eventually continue his journey in a university. Perhaps this was indeed the plan, and it could be that Stefano just trained less and less and that hit the results drastically. The other half of 2013 was uninspiring. Even though his results were still amazing compared to the overall European and American scene, he already lost the title of the best foreigner to Naniva and Scarlet. Another unusual thing was that Stefano started losing to non-Korean players like Luciferon, Harstam or even the new up-and-coming star Snoot, which was uncharacteristic for him only half a year ago, except that one single match with Idra. Finally, in August Stefano took part in the second season of WCS Europe, and this should have been his last tournament, and he indeed brought us some cool games, even defeating MC in the first round. In the second group stage, Stefano dropped the series to Duck Dog and had to play Lucifron, the best turn in Europe of that time. It was a very tough series that didn't end well for our French hero. On August the 6th, Stefano gave his farewell to the Circle of Two community in his final game against Lucifron, where he ended up getting eliminated from the WCS Europe Premier League after losing 0-2. This is unrecoverable, he's trying his best, he knows that this is the end of it. Congratulations, and it is Lucifron that moves on with an acknowledgement from Stefano. The reign of Stefano has come to an end. Ladies and gentlemen, we have witnessed something that's pretty emotional. Congratulations to Lucifron for moving on forwards. But his legacy was immense. Stefano was the greatest non-Korean player from 2011 till 2013, dominating the scene for two years in a row. He was the most accomplished, as well as one of the most earning players in StarCraft II esports. His different playstyles inspired many generations of Zerg players and he was a role model for his impeccable macro skills and deep understanding of the game. And despite some controversial situations, Stefano, unlike Idra or Naniwa, was regarded as one of the nicest people in the community. He always treated his opponents with respect and his favorite phrase was grats instead of GG, meaning that if somebody was able to defeat him, this player must be skillful and deserves it. And Stefano was also one, if not the most popular pro gamer on Twitch. His broadcasts would attract thousands of viewers. But what is funny, Stefano never really left StarCraft 2. Even though he stated in the famous match that this game was not for him anymore, this was hardly true, as already in spring of 2014, less than a year after his retirement, Stefano successfully qualified for WCS Europe, getting through the challenger and earning himself a spot in the Premier League. After that, Stefano kept on playing from time to time on different tournaments. Even though he never really went back to playing StarCraft 2 consistently, he still had good results throughout the rest years. Yet Stefano never committed to being full-time, and that's why he was sometimes jokingly named full-time retired pro gamer. And despite playing less, he was a solid top 5 Zerg player in Europe and overall one of the top 20 strongest players in the region. To this day, Stefano remains the most successful French player. He brought a lot of fame to his nation and inspired many young talents to compete in this beautiful RTS. Even though he doesn't compete as hard as he did and StarCraft 2 became more of a hobby than a job it used to be, 
Currently, he still holds the top one position in earnings, having won over $300,000 throughout his extended career. We could discuss him even longer and talk about all the amazing moments he brought to the fans, but this way the video will never end, and it's already a long one. So we'll stop here. I hope you enjoyed the story. Don't forget to check out my other StarCraft 2 related content and also check out Stefano's stream. I'll leave the link in the description, he still does stream sometimes. Have a good day, good luck and have fun!